What happens when the Pharisees and the Sadducees try to create a trap for Jesus? We'll find out in Matthew 22. Well, we are getting through Matthew. 28 chapters in Matthew, and we are on 22. We are going to end in some very serious times. I can't imagine what it must have been for like the apostles, where they find the Savior and the Messiah. They follow him. He is healing people. He is talking to people. People are coming to faith in him, and they are at the core of what's going on. And now they come into Jerusalem, and things are getting serious. Jesus' messages for the last bit have become more serious. And suddenly, apostles must have been worried. They must have wondered what in the world is going on that has changed the tone of everything. So the first thing we get is the parable of the wedding feast. The idea is that this guy is giving a wedding for his son. So he sends out his servants and asks all the people who are invited. But the invited people wouldn't come. They didn't want to come to the wedding. And so then he sends out other servants and he says, go tell people I killed an ox for you. I have fatted calves. We're having a big meal here. Come to my feast. And still nobody came. In fact, it says some people seized the servants and killed them. Like, what kind of people are these? He invited to his wedding. So then this king sends troops and burns their cities, burns their locations. You know, everyone at that time was kind of little tyrants of their own villages. And the problem is, is now the wedding feast is ready and there's no one who is going to come. He's not going to invite all these people. They probably weren't worthy to come into this feast. And so the ser- he tells his servant to go out and find everyone, good and bad, and just make sure that this wedding feast is filled with people. And so that's what they do. They always say that there's two parables inside of this one parable is that, first of all, the people who Jesus wanted to preach to, that, you know, he started out with the people of Israel, many people came and accepted him, but other people rejected him, including the very religious leaders who should have recognized him the most. And not only that, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill his apostles. People are going to be persecuted in the church by rulers for centuries. So that's the first part of this parable. The second part is, is that he looks at his guest and says, hey, there is no wedding garments here. You're not all dressed up. How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the king said, you know, cast him out in the darkness, throw him out. Because many are called, but few are chosen. It's not telling us that we have to dress up for church. What it is telling is that There are people who came who didn't take this seriously, who didn't come to to worship God. They came, but they had the attitude of, I'm just going and checking out and see what's there. I'm coming for the free food. You ever go to that and like the work Christmas party and a bunch of people show up for the free food and then leave right after the food is okay? That was me. But you get the idea. These were not people invested in coming to the wedding, they were just there to basically leech off of the wedding and not pay honor to God. So that means God is giving his invitation to everybody. And there are some people in the temples and the main temple, and they didn't pay attention. They were not interested in coming. Then there were some people who came who were the other people, but they did not come to worship Jesus. They were just there to hang out. And some of them, you know, the people who witnessed Jesus were Romans. Some of them were people who are just curious about what the heck is going on here. And so those are the people who are the people who attended the wedding but didn't have the proper garments. Then we get into the hot topic of paying taxes. So now, because these are the probably the more leadership in Jerusalem, we got the the big guys, you know, here to question Jesus. And they were trying to figure out how to trip Jesus up. They didn't like both the Pharisees and the Sadducees what Jesus was doing. They didn't like that he was taking people away from them. They also probably didn't like the fact that Jesus was calling them hypocrites and saying that they were a brood of vipers and calling out the things that they were doing. I mean, probably everyone knew that the Pharisees were quietly divorcing their wives and abandoning them to poverty. 
they probably knew that they weren't taking care of their parents, but probably people didn't talk about it because, you know, you don't want to talk bad of your rabbi. But Jesus was calling them out and making it clear. So they tr- came up with like plots. And I always laugh because I always said, as an atheist, this is what we always did. Oh, yeah. Well, what did Noah do with all the dinosaurs on the ark? You know, you try to come up with something that makes people shut up or ties them up. Oh, so you think I'm going to hell, do you? You know, <laughs> those kinds of things that you're trying to just attack people with a question. And that's what they're doing here. So he, they said, well, wait a minute. And tell us about the taxes because everybody hated taxes. Everybody hates taxes. But in this case, they didn't have a representative government, so they had no choice. And so then they say, so should we pay taxes to Caesar? Is it lawful? Meaning according to the law of God, not Roman law. And Jesus, he knew what they were up to. And he's like, why are you testing me about this? And so he tells him, and this is a very famous story, show me who's on the coin. Who's on the denarius? So he looks at it and he says, who is this? And they're like, well, that's Caesar, you know. And he says, okay, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar. Render is the exact word in ESV, and it means to return. This is Caesar's, give it back to him. You know, and give, here's the other part, and give to God the things that are God's. And it said that they marveled when they heard and they went away. Were they marveled because it was an amazing answer? Or were they marveled that he slipped out of their trap? You know, they thought they were so smart and figured out the perfect trap. Because if he said, pay taxes, then people would hate him. And if he said, don't pay taxes, well, this is a perfect opportunity to turn over. the This guy is over here telling people not to pay their taxes. So it was a trap either way. But the question I had in my mind after I read that is, okay, I get the give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. What is the things of God? And what is it we're supposed to give to God? And I realize it's, I think, the people. These are God's people. Jewish people, all people, all people are God's people. And that's what we're supposed to give back. The stuff of, of nations, their rulers, their coins, all that stuff, that, that's the thing of government. This is the thing of God is the people. And also maybe probably the temple. The temple was built for the people to worship God. So these things should come back. Now, in this case with the Roman government, This would have been Tiberius Caesar. This would have been Augustus Caesar's adopted son. And I think that it's splitting up this idea of a government that is not of God versus the people who are of God. And it said in the first generation of Christians that Jesus brought to people that they wouldn't pinch incense in the worship of the emperor. Good thing, right? Because his thing is about government. His thing is about taxes. It's not about the thing of God. We should not be treating Caesar, any leader, any government as God. So that's what the first Christians took it as. In references to all of this, there was talks about that there were three taxes. There was a ground tax, which was about 10% on anything that they grew. Then there was a 20% tax on oil and wine. And then there was an income tax, which was 1% of his income. And so every man, it said, from the age of 14 to 65 paid, and every woman from age 12 to 65, and the tax was a denarius, which means a day's salary. So a day's salary for that last tax. And the zealots, they did not want to pay tax. That's why they lived out in the wilderness. They wanted to avoid this. And so they claimed that paying the tax was dishonoring God. But Jesus is saying a little bit different than that. And this would have made the zealots mad. But he's saying, look, the, the Money, that's a government issue. That's not my issue. And so it brings us out to believe, you know, too, that in general, we are all citizens, whether you're back then citizens of Rome. I mean, not maybe official citizens of Rome, but you live in a Roman region. We live in whatever region we live in now. We're citizens of that, but ultimately we are citizens of God and the kingdom of heaven. And so we have to realize what is the business of God and what is the business of the government. And I was watching something. It was a murder mystery kind of thing. And it was basically a Christian who was saying that he didn't have to pay taxes because God doesn't believe in him. God never said that. In fact, he said quite the opposite. So after the Pharisees uh, failed on their little mission, the Sadducees come to him. And remember, they're the aristocrats. They're the upper class. And they only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, You know, it's going to be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, 
if I could say that, and numbers. And so they believed in the first five books. That means they didn't believe in the prophets. So all the things that the prophets wrote about after that point, they weren't really into. And so they didn't believe in spiritual matters. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in most of what people believe in, including people today in Judaism. So they said to him, oh, okay, so let's say that there's a resurrection and a man dies. He didn't have any children. So his brother married his wife because that was an obligation because, again, a widow would be doomed to poverty. So the brother would marry and take care of the wife. And so then there were seven brothers. <laughs> it's it's complex. This is quite the story going on. And so he says, you know, they first met. So, you know, so they got married, died, then married, died. And all of them married this woman. And then the woman dies later after all the men die, all the brothers die. Who's the wife going to be with? They didn't believe in the afterlife. I wonder if it's sort of like a mocking, you know, like today, like if you came across someone and you're a Christian and you say, oh, so when you go to heaven, are you going to play harps? You know, you're, you're, is it very sarcastic? But they looked down on people who believed in an afterlife. So for them to ask this question is weird. But so he says, no, you're wrong because in heaven, you're not going to be married or given in marriage. It doesn't mean we're not going to know each other, that we're not going to see our friends, that we're not going to hang out with people. It's just that we're not going to be married in that way. So then he reads them a passage that they would get. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. These people aren't dead. And we hear throughout Jesus' ministry, not even talking about transfiguration, where we see a living Moses and a living Elijah, but he was talking about with the tax collectors that people are going to hang out with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven and talk to them and find out what's up. But Jesus talked to them in a way they would get and a way that, he, you know, he knew that they were just trying to, to mess with him, that they weren't really looking for real answers because they didn't believe in any of it. They believed in the material world, like a lot of people today believe in the material world only. And they say that the reason a lot of the commentaries talked about is that, first of all, Jesus was slamming them, one, because they didn't understand the scripture, because these people are going to be living, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are living, and that they weren't taking the scripture seriously. And that he was proving them wrong with their own Torah. So that's the interesting thing. Jesus was not falling into their traps, which is cool. Then comes the great commandments. And so the Pharisees heard that he shut up the Sadducees. They probably says they gathered together, but they probably snickered a little bit because they thought, you know, they didn't like the Sadducees much either. And they said that one of them was a lawyer. So they, they got the guy who's good at questioning people on the stand, right? And said, well, of all the commandments of the law, which is the great commandment? He says, quote, in ESV, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments depend on the law and the prophets. This is the culmination of both the Torah and the prophets. And if you love God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and you loved your neighbor as yourself, the Ten Commandments are there. The other commandments are there. It is a summary of everything that God said. But what they were hoping that Jesus was going to do was single out one particular commandment, you know, is worshiping God the most important part or honoring your mother and father or not committing adultery. And they were hoping for that. And instead, what they got was this precise summary of both of them, of all of them together. Isn't it funny how Jesus can just say that and how quick that was for me to read? And yet I spend like three minutes explaining it or, you know, mulling it over in my own thought. His economy of uh, words was astonishing. So again, he shuts them up. You know, they keep throwing these tricks at him and he keeps batting them away because obviously he knows the scripture more than anybody and he knows what's in their hearts. So then Jesus says, okay, fine. What do you think about the Christ? This is the Messiah. That's the Greek word for Messiah. Whose son is he? So who, who are you talking about? Who is the Messiah? 
And so they said, well, it's, you know, the son of David. Again, being a son of David just means you're in the line of David, that there's going to be a lot of sons of David. Then Jesus says, okay, great. Then why is it David said, quote, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I will put your enemies under your feet. So David calls him Lord, is talking about Jesus. When they're talking about the Messiah and what David did, he is saying that David is calling Jesus Lord. And how is that possible? Because if Jesus is a descendant of David, how is he there with David? And that's what you get to do when you're God. You get to be all the things you want to be. You're David's Lord. You're also David's descendant. So he's referring to himself as being there with David. There's other places where he talks about being there with people before his time. And we also believe that David only could have done this through the Holy Spirit, because that's what brings the faith that he affirms in this Psalm 110, how he's able to then call Jesus Lord. My meditation this week is going to be about how do you respond to people who are trying to use the Bible in order to tear you away or to get you to shut up about God? How is it that Jesus confronted people when they were trying to misuse the Bible? And think about how maybe we could do a better job of doing that. My prayer this week is to pray about this summary of all the commandments and what it means to love God with your heart, your soul, and your mind, and how to love other people as yourself. We're good at loving ourselves and saying, look how important I am. But what if we treated other people on that same level? What I'm going to share, but this summary that Jesus gives us, is the thing we should always remember, that we should take with us wherever we go. And every time we're confronted with an action or behavior, we should remember, how can I love God with my heart, my soul, and my mind? And how can I love my neighbor as myself? And again, my neighbor, who's my neighbor? Everyone's my neighbor. That was what the Good Samaritan, which we haven't talked about yet, got right. You're the neighbor to everyone and they are your neighbor. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can subscribe to my other podcast, Small Steps with God. We're talking about history and it's a little bit because of this podcast, but who were all the people groups when it came to occupation, it came to heritage, and now... Last week, we talked about Greek. We're going to talk about Rome tomorrow and how it sets the stage for Jesus' final week in Jerusalem. I appreciate you listening. Thanks so much.